I'm going to be talking about various issues, uh, practical, and also some initiatives um, from the perspective of, of a publisher, because that's, that's my background, um, but also uh, a publisher that does think that um, we, as publishers, have a number of roles that we can play in improving the accessibility of clinical research data, which importantly is is part of a, a broader drive to publish more reliable and reproducible research. And access to data is uh, a particularly important, a particularly challenging part of that. But I don't want to ignore that um, sharing of software code and sharing of research protocols are also really important in opening up more of the research process. Given that I'm going to assume that a lot of the audience understand that sharing of research data is a good thing. I am going to keep the background and the introduction as to why we're working on these initiatives to, to a minimum. Well, I did just want to show this, this one slide because I think that when we're talking about clinical data access and improving the reliability of clinical evidence, the context um, is, is really important and also quite tangible because we're talking about research which can have a direct effect on human health. Um, and in the reporting of medical evidence, there's a, a worrying and in, an increasing amount of, of evidence and high profile cases where there's been a lack of access to the results or data underlying medical research, which is shown in, in, in a number of, of cases here on this slide, where we have um, vast amounts of money spent on drugs which are only marginally effective or, or don't turn out to be effective, or huge numbers of prescriptions for drugs which, which turn out to be ineffective or, or potentially harmful, which potentially um, could have been avoided if all of the, the evidence, results, and data had been published and were available to those who are assessing the effectiveness of medicines. So I think that's, that, that's worth bearing in mind that some of the, um, the real um, implications of, of um, not um, enabling access to, to all of the evidence underlying medications. So given, I'm going to assume that we'll, we're all agreed that this is a good idea to be um, increasing the accessibility of, of medical research data, I just want to think a little bit about what is driving some of these changes, some of this, these increases in transparency. There are several of them. Research funders and research institutions continue to be very important in, in driving change. There's a great list that was posted on, on Figshare earlier this year that, that has now 27 at least research funders that require data archiving as a condition of, of, of grants being, being given out. And in, in the medical field in particular, I've called out a few on this slide with a, a recent and fairly high profile addition being the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation having an open access and open data policy for their grant holders. In um, Europe, the European Medicines Agency, a regulatory agency, um, currently has a policy of providing access to documents um, underlying new uh, medical uh, uh, drug uh, applications, and they're also looking to extend that, that policy onto individual patient data as well. For several years since, since 2007 in, in the US, uh, the Food and Drug Administration Amendments Act has had legislation um, requiring access to results reporting or requiring results reporting. Other initiatives that, um, some of which I'll talk a bit more about shortly, from uh, academic or non-governmental groups that are increasing access to clinical data, one in particular the Yale Open Data Access Project, or Yoda, which I'll talk more about later. Also from uh, the pharmaceutical industry, there are initiatives to increase um, data access, such as clinical study data requests, CSDR, which I will also talk about shortly. And um, pleasingly, there's also a number of journals and groups of journals that are um, working towards data transparency, and I was particularly pleased uh, a few months ago to see the ICMJE, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, um, begin to form a consensus on, on data sharing because that's a particularly important and influential group, group of medical journals. And also with a number of different organizations and types of organizations that are looking to increase data sharing, individuals actually support data sharing as well. I have a couple of points here from a survey on which I was a co-author in the BMJ in 2012 where we, we surveyed several hundred clinical trialists specifically about their views on data sharing and individuals 
for the most part, do support the idea of sharing de-identified data through repositories and sharing those data with others on request. But the, cha the challenge is that often how and where that happens is, is not quite so clear. So the practical issues get in the way, despite there being a will generally to share clinical research data. And I mentioned that my perspective is very much that of, of a publisher, and I do see that there are several roles that publishers can play in increasing accessibility to clinical research data. You may be wondering why it is that publishers are interested in, in this. Um, I mean, well, there's we don't just want to publish more papers, we also want to publish better papers, more reliable evidence, and having access to the data underlying those publications is an important part of um, increasing accountability and, and transparency, and, and ultimately um, we, we hope and assume publishing more reliable papers as well, which also ties into um, the case of many medical journals and sometimes medical publishers that have stated goals, stated missions of increasing the reliability of evidence, which can ultimately impact on patient care. So having access to data is, is an important part of helping achieve that. Also, various aspects of linking to data, citing data, integrating data or visualizing data within the context of research articles is also um, an important driver of, of content innovation in online publishing. And um, um, many publishers are, of course, interested in continuing to um, add further value to the research literature. So, so data is, is certainly an important area of content innovation too. I see a really important role of publishers um, in terms of impacting and having practical information for, for researchers with data sharing in how journal policies are implemented and how those are communicated to authors, to researchers. And there are a number of different approaches, a number of different types to journal data sharing policy which researchers will be subject to um, depending on their, their journal of choice. Now with this slide I've, I've uh, tried to categorize the different types or at least order the different types of journal data sharing policy that, that I'm aware of. Um, generally speaking with the, um, the stronger policies, the more stringent policies towards the bottom of the slide. And so there are several different types. I'll not go over all of them in great detail for purposes of time, but researchers submitting their paper to um, a medical journal could be um, asked to state in every paper just what data are available with their paper. And that could be that no data are available at all, um, but they still have to state what's available. So there's least transparency about what is available. Um, probably the most common type of policy which you might see in journals is the minimum requirement from um, all of the Biomed Central journals, for example, or a number of the Nature journals is that it's implied as a condition of submission or publication, the authors have to share their data on request with other scientists after publication, and they also have to share their data on request with editors and reviewers as well. So that's implied, and many people will be effectively subject to that policy after submitting a paper to a journal. How effective those are is, is an area of debate, and that's something I'll come back to later. There are stronger policies that have emerged. There are journals now which are having requiring active data sharing for, for every, every submission or every publication. More journals introducing standard sections or data availability sections in every paper. Um, PLOS um, is, is one example of that. BMJ have introduced a, um, a data sharing requirement for, for, all, for all clinical trials for example. Um, and then outside of the medical uh, publishing area, there are a number of journals that have had mandated sharing with links to underlying data sets in every paper for a number of years in areas such as ecology and, and animal genomic studies. And there's also a new type of publication that's very data focused and that publishes data papers that, that has particularly strong requirements of sharing data as a condition of submitting a paper to those journals. Uh, these are journals such as uh, Scientific Data, which I represent, and also uh, GigaScience and F1000 Research are, are also examples. I'm just going to highlight um, a couple of examples of journal data sharing policies and journal data and data sharing by journals in action on the next couple of slides. Um, this example that I'm showing here is from um, Biomed Central's Trials Journal, and this is actually data sharing via supplementary information files. Now, 
generally speaking, sharing data through dedicated subject-specific repositories is the preferred approach. Uh, that's certainly the editorial policy of, of the nature journals, but often and particularly in medicine, um, there isn't an obvious repository repository for data. So publishing data via supplementary information files is actually quite valuable um, when, when um, there's, there's no other option or there's no available repository. This example here is um, a clinical study where the authors have published as a supplementary information file the anonymized data from 19,000 individual patient data from one of the largest stroke trials ever conducted. Uh, and you can download the file as a CSV, which opens in Excel, um, straight from the article. Interestingly, this file of 19,000 individual patient data actually came to less than, less than five megabytes. But this is an example of a journal that encourages the publication of raw data wherever possible, an example of um, at least one group of authors um, doing that. Another example of where journals have dedicated data availability statements and then link those to data sets that are hosted in an external repository. Um, again, a medical example to keep this relevant. Um, this is from the open access journal BMJ Open where they have a statement um, towards the end of the paper and a partnership with the Dryad Digital Repository and they link through to the data supporting this study um, in, in the Dryad Repository. I want to talk now about a new type of journal and a new type of publication that has a particular focus on journal, uh, has a particular focus on data. These are data journals which publish data articles or data papers or, or we call them data descriptors. And so there are perhaps 20 or more of, um, of these data journals covering broad discipline, uh, numbers of disciplines or, or more specific disciplines. Um, I'm going to talk about scientific data because that's the one that, that I represent, but there are, of course, others, others available as well. Um, these journals, generally speaking, don't publish traditional research papers. They publish articles which are designed to fully describe research data sets, so they won't generally include discussion, analysis, or conclusions in the articles. They are designed to make data more visible by providing a formal, peer-reviewed publication for a data set which might otherwise not be published, um, and also to act as a means to give more credit and rewards to researchers for sharing their data, so in the form of, of, of a formal publication. Data journals also generally have some additional features um, or processes which n n are not necessarily standard in regular journals. For example, ensuring that um, data are much more visible to peer reviewers, which, which sadly often isn't the case for traditional journals. Data journals also fit very nicely with this concept that I've quoted at the bottom of the slide of intelligently open data. So this is a phrase that was coined in the UK Royal Society's Sciences and Open Enterprise report, which is um, really um, emphasizes the point that data sharing is is obviously a good thing, but um, we can't really derive much value from shared data unless we can understand and reuse and build upon those data. So, so data journals tend to have a focus on ensuring data are actually understandable and reusable. And so that, that's often a key part of the, the articles they publish and the, and the peer review processes that they have. So this is scientific data on this slide. We launched in May 2014 and have published around uh, 100 articles so far, uh, making us, I think, about the, the second biggest data journal that's, um, that, that's available, at least by volume, published. A couple of things that are different about scientific data, it's very broad in scope. It covers all of the sciences, including social sciences. Um, we also have a dedicated data curation editor, Varsha, whose role, amongst other things, involves the creation of standardized metadata um, for every article and every data set that we publish, which enables advanced users to do sophisticated comparisons between the data sets that we've published. Another defining part of scientific data is um, a bespoke peer review process that's been defined for the journal. Um, I mentioned that the data journals do have uh, a particular focus on reviewing data. Uh, this is how we do it at Scientific Data. So importantly, peer review of data and the descriptions of data at Scientific Data don't focus on impact and importance of data. 
Um, we do welcome high impact and high interest data sets, but also data which are from single experiments or might be perceived to be boring, I suppose, in, in, in some respects. But as long as the data are um, complete and understandable and reusable, then, then they should be published. Uh, so our peer review focuses on uh, whether there is enough information available to understand the data, so are they complete, can others reproduce, are the data com uh, prepared in line with community standards, if they exist, and also are data in the best possible repository, and were the scientific methods used to produce those data rigorous and sound. So that, that, that's the um, a summary of our peer review process. So more than halfway into the presentation about sharing medical data, and I feel I should probably speak to the elephant in the room, which is that um, patient privacy is a really important issue in conducting medical research and publishing medical research, um, which means anonymization of data. And this is um, is certainly possible, and it is, it, it is there are some examples of anonymized medical research data published in, in peer-reviewed journals, although I'm, I'm not actually aware of that many having been published. Nevertheless, um, I'm highlighting here um, a table from a set of guidelines which, which I worked to produce back in 2009 and 2010, which was intended to give um, authors, peer reviewers and editors a minimum standard, a way in which they could de-identify data sets so that they could be published in open access journals. Um, in putting these guidelines together, we came up with a list of 26 direct and indirect identifiers, and the idea is that when reviewers are assessing data sets or researchers are preparing data sets, that if a data set contains any direct identifiers, then it, 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 it shouldn't be published openly, and if the data set contains three or more indirect identifiers, such as age or sex, then um, the data set should be reviewed by an independent research or ethics committee to assess the risk of identification before it was uh, submitted for publication. Now, these are designed to be quite easy to use and non-technical guidance. They were um, derived through a non-Smith systematic review of the literature and through expert consensus building. Um, they have been adopted by the BMJ and some Biomed Central journals, but as I mentioned, to my knowledge, there are relatively few examples of open clinical trial data sets published in the literature. That example from the stroke trial earlier is, um, is one exception. So, and I also want to highlight that there are other guidelines available for, for anonymizing data. There's a group at Ottawa led by Khaled El Amam, for example, who have a, a method of assessing the risk of re-identification in data sets. So this lack, really, of open clinical trials, trial data sets in the literature has led me, has led us at Scientific Data to think about whether or not we can take a more pragmatic approach to improving the availability of data underlying the, the research literature. Now, I mentioned that um, research data available on request, typically from the corresponding author, tends to be the most common policy of papers published in journals. However, this slide that I'm showing now um, gives three examples of that policy really not being terribly effective when it's tested post-publication. So there are a number of examples where secondary researchers have tried to get access to data that's reported in um, journals that have a policy of requiring data on request, and they haven't been able to get that, usually in well over half of the cases. So this process clearly isn't as robust as it could be. Um, so if we assume that most data aren't sufficiently anonymized to be published openly, how can we actually improve the robustness of this policy of data on request? Some of the reasons why perhaps researchers aren't um, willing to share data even on request are highlighted um, from this survey um, that I mentioned earlier. So some of the reasons why researchers are concerned about sharing data are in this, um, in this graph. And in particular, two major concerns that, that we hear are concerns about inappropriate reuse of data by secondary researchers on the left-hand side, and also about maintaining patient confidentiality. Um, now, there are some projects and initiatives that have emerged which actually enable access to data while addressing um, these two concerns quite effectively. 
Um, they, uh, examples of these are the Yale Open Data Access Project, Yoda, which I mentioned earlier, and the Clinical Study Data Request, CSDR. Uh, Yoda is a group of academics and CSDR is an industry-led initiative. So these are websites, portals, where secondary researchers can see a listing of clinical research studies, clinical trial data sets, and they can request access to them. The Yoda project has well over 100 studies from at least two pharmaceutical companies, um, and clinical study data request was initially started by GlaxoSmithKline, but now has, I believe, well over 2,000 studies listed from multiple sponsors, multiple pharmaceutical companies. Um, the links are there if you wish to check them out in more detail. But in general, how these services enable data to be shared while not compromising privacy and ensuring appropriateness of secondary analyses, they have a number of features that enable them to do that. So firstly, they um, have a, a non-public way of sharing data. They have a controlled access environment in which secondary researchers can access data. And that is not... Um, allowed to happen until their request to access the data has been assessed and approved and also the requests are approved by an independent uh, governance body effectively. So the requests to access data are managed not by the original investigators or the study sponsors by, but by an independent group um, which is um, uh, one of the important features of, of ensuring um, balance in, um, in those requests. Also, these, the, the conditions with what one can do with the data and, and ways in which uh, participants uh, in the research study will be protected is through the use of documents called DUAs or data use agreements, um, which secondary research have to, have to agree to when, when gaining access to the data. And also these services have um, anonymization checks before the data are, um, are made available even in a controlled access way. So these are certainly enabling greater access to um, clinical research data, even if not um, open access. However, what these data on request services, Yoda and CSDR, don't have is the kind of permanence and discoverability and visibility in the peer-reviewed literature. Um, so usually when researchers are designing a new, a new study, they tend to look for what evidence is already out there, and that tends to be in journals, and it tends to be discovered in bibliographic databases like PubMed. So what we've been trying to do at Scientific Data, um, by consulting with stakeholders in um, the data repository field with pharmaceutical companies, and with, with uh, funders and with researchers themselves and editors is how can we connect up the good work of these new data on request services with the fundamental um, features of data repositories for enabling data sharing and connect those things up with peer-reviewed articles where researchers tend to find reliable information. So this is the, uh, these are the aims of a, of a working group that we put together in December 2014 and we've produced draft guidelines so far on how journals can potentially publish peer-reviewed articles about data which are only available on request but to have really robust and persistent links between those articles, data on request services and data repositories. And we hope that these will produce a number of benefits and in particular you know, increasing the visibility of clinical research data which can be requested even if those clinical research data themselves aren't publicly available. The guidelines are in the preprint archive, bio archive, and are referenced on the previous slide. Some of the key recommendations from the guidelines are on this slide, and they apply to the different stakeholders that, that, are, that are impacted by the guidelines. So for clinical researchers, we recommend that they need to be prepared to share data on request with short embargoes, because they're probably going to be subject to such a policy from most of the journals they choose to submit their work to. Editors and publishers certainly have work to do here. Um, I think we can all work harder to check actively policy compliance for every submission. So when researchers are submitting papers, whether or not they can actually comply with a request to share, to share their data. Sponsors and funders of clinical research also have an important role in ensuring that they have 
potentially, um, partnerships with data repositories to enable permanent and persistent archiving of their data. And repositories, are, I think, are really, really key. They are enabling access to data across a wide variety of fields. At Scientific Data, we work with 70 or more different repositories for specific areas that we cover, um, generally for open access data and for repositories to support controlled access to data in a reliable and consistent way, they do need to introduce new features, which um, I'll talk about um, on this slide. So at Scientific Data, we have a list of 70 recommended repositories and we assess them by several criteria and they're included at the end of the presentation, but I'll not go into them for purposes of time. But through the process of developing these guidelines, we've come up with a number of additional features for data repositories to enable them to provide access um, in a controlled fashion to clinical free research data. And then for us as a journal, as a publisher, to have reliable and robust links with those, with those repositories in our peer-reviewed articles and so that those links are persistent. Ultimately, we don't want dead links in, in peer-reviewed articles. We want um, readers of articles to connect up easily the different um, products, the different outputs of scientific research. So repository is non-public data, um, amongst other things, need to provide landing pages for clinical data sets or metadata records, which can be publicly available and permanently linked peer-reviewed articles. They need to have systems for enabling researchers to agree to data use agreements, um, and ideally they should be independent of study sponsors, as are those data on request services, Yoda and CSDR that I mentioned. Ideally, um, we also want to see transparent systems for requesting access to data and re reviewing those requests to access data. And also, equally for open access data, as for, um, for closed access data, those data need to be available and preserved um, for the long term. And for long term, we mean at least 10 years. So we put out an editorial um, in July calling for comments on these guidelines. I'm not showing that here, but what I am showing is a data descriptor we published in Scientific Data at the same time as that editorial, which actually is an example of our first data descriptor which is open access, but actually links to data which isn't publicly available. It's available on request. So I just want to show this one example in finishing the presentation. Um, I'll be the first to say that this example doesn't fully comply with the best practice guidelines that we have proposed, but it is certainly, we believe, an improvement on providing data on request. So this project is the Brain Genomics Superstruct project. Um, it has a number of functional magnetic resonance imaging data sets from healthy subjects and some of those data can be up, are available publicly but they have to be requested and then there are some even richer clinical data where you have to go to the study sponsors directly to request access to those data. So in this article there is step-by-step -step information on how one can obtain access to the data sets. So the very rich detailed clinical information you have to uh, request it from uh, the Loney Image Data Archive project website and they have instructions on how you can request access to the data. And there's also a component which is deposited in the Dataverse uh, repository, which is one of our partner repositories. And I'm showing that on this slide. So this is um, linked out from the article and there's a number of data sets uh, listed there and one has to request access to data and then before you're given access to the data you have to log in and then agree to um, a data use agreement, one of these features that I've mentioned. So what we're hoping is this is, uh, is a, a useful example, it's a useful addition to the, the debate about how we can have these more robust systems of providing access to data on request. So I just want to, to sum up the five P's of clinical data disclosure, which were the title of this presentation and, and which I therefore promised to you at the start of it. Um, so from my perspective, the, um, the five P's of, of clinical data disclosure are firstly publishing, so ensuring we can publish as much of this information as possible, or if not publishing it, then linking it reliably to the peer-reviewed literature. The second P is policy and journal policy, I think is really important and how we as publishers and editors actually check and enforce that policy is really crucial and can have really important impact on, on, um, on data accessibility. Another P is also peer review. I think it's really important to make data visible to peer reviewers. Even if we don't expect them to reanalyze data, we should at least 
give them the ability to access data if they wish to dig into it. Privacy is undoubtedly key in sharing clinical research data and um, various mechanisms exist to try and address that challenge. And finally, pragmatism, I think, is important with clinical research data. It's certainly something that I have come to learn over the last few years is that while open access to research data is a great thing, we often can't let the best be the enemy of the good. And if we can experiment with more pragmatic approaches, such as this current initiative at scientific data, then hopefully that will still lead to greater visibility and accessibility of clinical research data.